Um, I'm, I'm Roger Packer, uh, Senior Vice President of Neuroscience and Behavioral Medicine, and I'm happy to uh, welcome you both to Grand Rounds and to the first uh, speaker, our Richmond Payne Lecture, for this year's uh, 26th Annual Pediatric Neurology Update course. The update course will focus on headaches, and for you in the audience that are not registered for the course, uh, if you want to hear more about headaches, just stay. There are um, outside some um, uh, information about the other speakers for the course. Uh, I want to also, because I'm told I have to, uh, welcome the WebEx people. We, we hope you're all there. You should be here in the room, but if you weren't able to be here in the room, we're happy you're joining us by WebEx. Uh, we will have, this will sort of be two parts of areas of discussion for folks. After our, our Richmond Payne lecturer speaks today, there'll be a short question and answer period. And also, at the end of the day, as, as, after all of the members of the multidisciplinary headache team at Children's National speak, uh, we will have a roundtable discussion that will move on to about 12.30, a quarter to one today. So once again, for the residents and medical students, you're welcome to come back. It is my pleasure to uh, be able to uh, announced uh, this year's uh, Richmond Pain Lecturer, our 26th annual, probably close to 30th because predating me, Dr. Shelburne also had some Richmond Pain Lecturers here, and it's Dr. Andrew Hershey. Dr. Hershey is really an international leader in pediatric headache, training at Wash U in, in St. Louis. We heard yesterday how he got into pediatric headache. We all thought when we were training that Arthur Prensky's best, the most important thing was headaches, and he was sort of forced into the entity and then turned it over to Dr. Hershey to, de to help develop the program at Wash U, and then moving over to Cincinnati. Dr. Hershey has, has had multiple publications in pediatric headache, has written books and chapters, and he's also recently been the, um, uh, the PI for the CHAMP study, which I think you might speak about a little bit today, I'm not sure which is the largest prospective study looking at preventative uh, ways to try to treat pharmacologically migraine and maybe overcome some of the placebo effect that has sort of hurt other studies. He may speak a little bit about that, but he certainly is an international leader in pediatric headache. He also trained Dr. DiSabella, although I think he avows any real responsibility for that. But Dr. DiSabella, who runs our headache program and will be coordinating the rest of the program. So it's tr truly my honor to uh, introduce this year's Richmond Pain Lecturer, Dr. Andrew Hershey, and he'll be speaking on how genetics and pathophysiology can help determine treatment choices in headache. Dr. Hershey. Well, thank you, Dr. Packer. Thank you, Dr. Isabella, for inviting me. Thank you for the audience and coming in, and uh, um, hopefully uh, we'll have a good, enjoyable hour or so to talk about uh, what interests me is sort of the molecular biology and how uh, we can understand that in headaches and migraines and how potentially influence how we treat things. Um, sort of the uh, uh, ever-present disclosure slide, really just talking about the uh, different involvements that I'm, I'm involved with. I'll let you read through that. I won't read through it myself. So as far as the objectives of what I want to talk today is really help to recognize pediatric migraines in, in adolescents, young adults, and, uh, and in pediatrics in general, incorporate sort of an understanding of the basic pathophysiology, including the genetic components to it. Um, obviously, in an hour, we're not going to be able to contact the full depth of the and breadth of pathophysiology, but give you enough of a taste to sort of maybe help uh, incite some of you to consider treat, uh, uh, studying headaches and advancing our field, but as well as understand how you can incorporate that better understanding into your management. Um, in, Employing some multidisciplinary or multi level approaches. So, why study migraine? Um, as we look at migraine, there's, we can actually break it into multiple different parts, including the disease characterization, sort of understand why a migraine understands and exists as a migraine, some of the potential underlying pathophysiology, what makes a sensitive brain, um, some of the changes that may occur in people that have frequent headaches or underlying associations, such as menstrual related migraines, and then then uh, sort of I'll finish up and, and not talk about the outcome and progression, but more some of the treatment aspects and from what we understand about the migraine pathophysiology that can incorporate into understanding why the treatments we choose, we choose. So as far as disease characterization, um, I know Mark's going to talk about more of this as he goes through the, uh, the characterizations, but to just get everyone sort of on the same page is what do we mean by migraine? A lot of people think they can recognize the migraine. A lot of people say they, they 
recognize something they don't think is a migraine when actually it is. So to help resolve all that, the International Classification of Headache Disorders was developed um, and is now in its third beta edition. It divides headaches into two main groups, uh, the primary headaches, which are headaches intrinsic to themselves as the disorder, which includes migraines, uh, attention type headaches, the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, which people may be more familiar with cluster headaches, but it falls under the tax, and then other primary headache disorders. Um, and then there's secondary headache disorders, or headaches uh, that are caused or associated with something else. Um, it changed from associated with to attributed to to try to get more of that cause and effect nature of it, um, that really it should be the cause, and if you treat the cause, the headache should go away. If you treat the cause and the headache doesn't go away, then you have to reevaluate what that potential diagnosis may be. And things like the post-traumatic headaches or sinus headaches, which is oftentimes mis misdiagnosed, um, falls in this misdiagnosis, and the people think they have sinus headaches when they don't. Some basic concepts just when we talk about this. So we talk about migraine, we're talking about the sort of the level one, and that includes all the migraines. But we, uh, the criteria are hierarchical, and meaning that we can break it down into different levels. So for example, here you can have migraine with aura, which would be 1.2, or migraine with typical aura, which would be 1.2.1, or typical aura without headaches, which is a further subtype. And there's actually even a fifth digit in some areas that are now being added, which relates to this talk. And that's as we identify the genes that may be directly associated with that uh, phenotypic character, it'll add to that fifth digit. Um, it's the diagnosis within the last year, um, so but genetics is a lifetime, so uh, the, the Time duration is somewhat vague in the criteria, but in general, it's one year. Um, and you diagnose, and this is one of the keys that we've tried to push forth in the ICDH criteria over and over again, and Mark may go over this a little bit more, but you diagnose all the headaches the patient has. So a patient is not a single diagnosis, but you're diagnosing the patient and the different headaches they can have. So for example, if somebody has very frequent headaches and they sometimes get auras, they could have a migraine without aura, migraine with aura, and if they're overusing their medication, they could have medication overuse. Um, and they can have both primary and secondary headaches. So if the headache looks like a migraine, you can diagnose it as a migraine, but if it happens after they've had a sport injury, it could be a post-concussive headache. So they could have an acute post-concussive headache and a migraine. So, uh, and then not every headache they have to have has to meet all those criteria. Again, you're diagnosing the patient, not the headache. So if the patient has enough headaches to have migraine, they've got migraines, even if not every single headache is a migraine headache. So getting those sort of concepts since we're talking about, so we're all talking about the same group and page. I'm going to move on the, just to some of the characteristics we do see. And I won't steal all of Mark's talk, but the part of it to talk about a little bit is specifically focused on migraines. So as we subclassify migraines, migraines really can be subclassified into multiple different types. The, the typical one is the migraine without aura. And I'll, I'll avoid using, for any of you that are used to common and classic, uh, nomenclature, we don't use that anymore. We're trying to really get away from it. It's really confusing. Um, hopefully we've successfully done that. So that's migraine without aura or migraine with aura. But then the migraine with auras have multiple different subtypes that can be included in there. Um, what you won't see here anymore is basilar migraine. Uh, that's really been removed. It's recognized that it's really an aura. Uh, it's a brainstem aura, and uh, we really don't need to worry about the basilar artery anymore um, as that part of it. And there's some, some interesting pathophysiology that's been demonstrated with that. Uh, there's also chronic migraine, complications of migraines. Um, and then the sort of in the ICDH3, one of the things we changed um, was that we went ahead from childhood periodic syndromes, which many of you have heard, to changing it to episodic syndromes that may be associated with headaches. So I want to get more words in there, but the other reason was that the recognition that it's not just kids that can have these episodic syndromes, that adults can also. So it really to remove the childhood part of it and recognize and expand it that the adults can actually learn from those of us that take care of kids. Um, so what is a migraine without aura? I'm going to talk about just three of the diagnoses and, and, and actually brief them fairly briefly, but again, to get everybody on the same page of what we're talking about. So when we say ICDH migraine without aura, we're talking about they have to have at least five attacks over the past year, so they don't have to have a lot of attacks. Um, they should last four to 72 hours untreated. Uh, kids are allowed a shorter headache, so if they're under 15, it's two to 72 hours. Um, but we include sleep of it. So if a child goes to sleep with a headache, the headache really is not technically considered gone until they wake up without the headache. And so it's actually fairly easy to get the time duration, although a lot of people argue that kids' headaches are shorter. Um, we're actually finding that we can get the time duration fairly easily, and I'll show it a little bit in a few minutes. Um, they have to have two or four characteristics. Um, the term migraine actually comes from ancient Greek, uh, so Galen actually coined migram for one-sided headache. Uh, so the classic definition for adults is it's a one-sided headache. In kids, 
it's actually more often frontal or frontal or bitemporal. Um, so I think that really, and we've argued a lot, that it should be focal, not unilateral. But it's the typical throbbing. It doesn't have to be severe. It can be moderate, and it does seem to change the kid's activities. And the need to have either nausea and or vomiting or light and sound sensitivity. For migraine with aura, there was a few changes that have modified it more to group everything under the, the bigger umbrella of migraine with aura. So there's six different types of, of largely reversible aura syndromes. Uh, the more typical ones are the visible or the visual speech and, uh, and sensory ones or the speech as we call dysphagic auras. Um, whereas the hemiplegic aura, the formerly basilar migraine or brainstem aura and the retinal auras are, are lesser seen. Um, the typical characteristics of the auras can be seen here, but usually it's, it's within five to 60 minutes um, of duration, starting at the onset or just prior to the headache and needs to be fully reversible. The one that has the most difficulty with kids is being unilateral because most of the kids we see with the visual auras, they're sort of over their entire visual field. Um, by definition, a dysphagic aura, so a kid that in the past some of you may call a confusional migraine, is really not, they're not confused. In fact, if you ask the kids afterwards, they know exactly what they wanted to say. It was just what's coming out really sounds like gibberish. And I'm not gonna talk about that, but if you're really interested in that, um, go to YouTube and go to Grammy's Stroke. There was a, actually a reporter that had one captured on uh, on video as she was presenting at the Grammys. Um, they thought she was having a stroke, she was actually having a, a dysphagia for her. But I use that oftentimes when I see my kids that are having a history of some of those dysphagia to show them what it's like and they say, that's exactly what has happened to me. And then the final sort from a diagnostic point to just get in case is what do we mean by chronic migraines? Um, so chronic migraines, there's a couple of different keys that have come out of ICDH3. One is chronic migraines trump chronic tension type headaches. So if somebody's got migraine features and they've got semi-frequent numbers of those that relate to migraines, you're gonna call it migraine or chronic tension type headaches. So that's 15 or more to headache days per month for at least three months, um, at least eight of which have migraine-related features, whether it's migraine without aura or migraine with aura, or the one thing we also added was even if the patient believes they have migraines. So if the patient thinks they have migraines and they have infrequent headaches, still counts as chronic migraines. So what do we see? Um, talking about, and this was actually, it's a few years old, a summer student actually came and, and reviewed our database. We've actually doubled the number since then, but it gives a nice trend of what we see and we can look at it over the years um, instead of just grouping it together. So the mean age group of the kids we see in the Cincinnati Children's Headache Center is about 12. Um, and uh, we can look at their diagnostic criteria. McKinsey Miller was the summer student. She's actually now in med school, so that shows how far it's come along from when she was a high school student. So this demonstrates the frequency. Um, one interesting thing, and at the bottom of all these graphs is gonna be their age. And what we can see here is, is the kids at least we see clearly have at least five headaches per month and, uh, for over a year and actually per month meet the criteria. But there's an interesting trend that the kids at least we're seeing are having more and more frequent headaches by the time they come to see us. And there is some selection bias that they're coming to see us. So obviously the frequency of the headaches is contributing to that. So these are kids with frequent headaches. If we look at the duration, and we ask three questions, we ask the duration. We ask, what's your shortest headache? What's your longest headache? What's your average headache? We try to help capture the duration. Uh, what we can also see is if the cutoff is two hours, and hours there are on the, the axis on the right, is which you can see is that all the averages actually exceed the two hour mark. In fact, the long headaches, oftentimes in some of these older kids, are getting to be two to three days long. Um, so they clearly can meet the duration criteria. Um, this is interesting from the location perspective. So as I said, the criteria require for a unilateral headache. But in kids, as we start to discuss the, the transition, um, we start to see it moves from the frontal to really the uh, bitemporal and, and then to the unitemporal. But the unitemporal uh, is actually representative in the lowest frequency. Um, and although this hasn't been proven, there's some interesting sort of phenomenology that might explain why this is going on. And uh, Rami Bernstein has, has looked into this in mice and looked at the penetration of dural neurons through the skull. And what he found in neonatal mice is that the neurons sort of distribute equally across the skull, so it gives one of a diffuse one. And in the adult mice, it only diffuses at the uh, suture points, which may explain at least a relationship that has that connection with the dural neurons through the suture points. You can imagine they didn't look at developing mice or adolescent mice. But well, my speculation would be the reason we're seeing this trend is that the skull is hardening. And really, we, is the hard, skull doesn't reach its full hardening potential until at age 25 in uh, humans, which sort of explains the shifting. Uh, again, that's all speculation, but I think it fits a model nicely if we, we fit it into further on some of the things that Dr. Bernstein has shown, that that feedback loop that occurs through the dural penetration may be part of what allows some people to be responsive to botulinum toxin injection. <clears throat> 
If you look at severity, severity is actually a thing that doesn't change. It's actually very consistent, not only across time, across ages, but also across our treatment, is that the average severity is around six to seven. So it falls right exactly between moderate to severe in terms of duration. So some of the headaches are moderate, some of the headaches are severe, but the average kid is telling me their headache is right at the border. And then if we look at associated symptoms, and I think this has, comes up in the several discussions, we discussed it a little bit last night, of why there may be, in my opinion, a large misdiagnosis of Potts-type syndrome, is that if you ask a lot of these kids, you can see over their age, they're describing lightheadedness. So one of the hallmarks that we use and treat is they're developing lightheadedness, and the lightheadedness presumably comes from the vascular dilation that occurs during a migraine attack, is that as kids are growing, as their vasculature is more dynamic, um, they report when their blood vessels do get dilated that they feel more to lightheadedness, and that's a fairly consistent trend we see in that blue there. The other things we see is vomiting starts to be reduced. In fact, it's of the four hallmark uh, associated symptoms, it's the least frequent, whereas the photophobia and phonophobia does slightly increase as they go through ages. So these are some of the trends that we see across the ages of kids. So why is one of the reasons? Well, we know in adults that uh, three times as many adult women as men have migraines. So is the menstrual pattern part of the effect of this, and is it it's puberty? So we tried to look at this in a group of girls from nine to 18 year olds. Uh, uh, so we looked at almost 1,000 girls and clinically asked them if they had their first period, do their headaches worsen or do they have headaches with their periods? Now, and if they haven't had their periods, have they started to notice a monthly pattern? And this is what we were able to see. So we actually saw that really by most of the day 13 or 14 is where we things start to level off, and those are the white bars there, when girls had a sort of a consistent pattern or could consistently detect that they had a menstrual pattern to their headaches. If we gave them a choice to say a, a maybe, it really gets up into that 50 to 60% range, which is typical for adults. And that's happening by age 13 or 14. So by the time girls are age 13 to 14, they're starting to notice that monthly or consistent menstrual pattern. The other thing I think this shows interestingly, though, is that girls pre-having their periods, even down to age nine, are starting to see that monthly presence. So they're starting to detect some hormonal changes that may occur as the first stages of puberty. And although I don't have the results or follow-up to this, um, the, data, the statisticians analyzing the data right now, is that it doesn't probably fit with the classical adult picture that we thought it was due to estrogen withdrawal, that the progesterone effect actually probably has a much bigger effect. And in fact, we don't see the girls in the 12 to 14 to 15 age cycling their estrogen uh, with their headaches that was seen in the adult study, but they are cycling their progesterone. So I think there's some interesting uh, sensitivity of the brain to the estrogen and the progesterone that may be contributing in these, these different groups of kids. If you look at the timing, this is very typical of what the adults also see. So day zero is the first day of the period, and we actually see most of the girls report their headaches start one to two days before their period does. So the headache is actually the onset. So for the girls that are very regular or don't have a regularity to their menstrual cycle yet, it may be difficult to detect their menstrual migraine, and that's why some of them are in that not sure area and as the regularity improves. Um, one of the other things, and this is uh, link it back to treatment, there's really no evidence that in girls, starting for girls on birth control pills, has any influence on their migraines and menstrual migraine patterns. So uh, oftentimes we'll have uh, pediatricians come in and they've already started the girls on that, and there's no evidence that that actually helps. Um, and in fact, in some of the adult studies, especially if they have auras, it may hurt them by increasing the potential risk of stroke that can be associated because of the uh, birth control pills, although many of them are now much more lower in estrogen effects, so that affects for minimal. Um, Statistically, if anybody has sort of predate that question, the, the risk of a 20-year-old girl having a stroke is about three out of 100,000. If they have migraine without aura, it doubles to about six out of 100,000. If they have migraine with aura, it doubles again. Uh, so 12 out of 100,000. If they have birth control pills, it doubles again up to 24 out of 100,000. Um, and then if they smoke, it increases 20-fold. So we tell them really shouldn't smoke. The birth control pills, you can sort of say you are having a slight increased risk, but you need to be aware of that. So to take another step, we also looked at their genomic expression pattern, and this gets into some of the, the work we've looked in in terms of gene expression. So we looked at three different groups. We looked at those girls that were having an acute menstrual migraine attack, so they're having their menstrual period and they're having a migraine. We looked at girls that didn't have a menstrual pattern during an acute attack, so they were not having their menstrual period, but they were having an acute migraine attack. And then at, at Children's Hospital, um, since at Children's, we have a cohort of kids that have been collected, about 1,000 kids that have been fully phenotyped and differentiated, and we can take groups of those out. So we took the girls that were having their period but never had a history of headaches, um, so we can compare that. And we compared the gene expression profile of, of these three different groups. Um, 
for those that have seen a heat map, so sort of a first basic science slide that we can set up here, um, you can break the kids across the top um, into similarities, so who's similar or not. So the uh, reason I expanded the branching pattern was to focus more on the branching pattern than the, than the shiny colors. Uh, but what you can see is the girls that had a menstrual pattern, uh, which are shown in the red, mouse here, uh, versus those that didn't, clearly branched apart from each other. So the girls were more like the, the group that they happened to fall in. The real way to look is, is more of a Venn diagram to sort of see how we can divide these in. So we can divide the girls, whether they compare the non-menstrual girls versus controls, uh, the menstrual girls versus controls, and the menstrual versus the non-menstrual. And these are the different genes that were expressed in this profile. So there's specific genes. We can say there are 127 genes that seem to be non-menstrual related migraine genes. So these are migraine genes that were not related to their menstrual period. Um, there were also 77 menstrual related migraine genes. Um, and then in addition to that, there were some non-specific genes that seemed to cross over the two. Um, in addition, there were some genes that seemed to be more often in migraine than non-menstrual migraine, but occurred in both groups. And then finally, the 574, the biggest group, were just genes that were differentially expressed because of having a menstrual period itself, not necessarily a headache. Uh, if we look at where these can cluster in, and this gives sort of insight to some of the different pathophysiological processes that may go on, uh, for menstrual-related migraines, these included genes that dealt with mitochondrial function, oxidative phosphorylation, and, and metal ion binding. Uh, what does it mean? I think part of the reason for gene expression profiling is it gives us an insight of where to look next. And so I can't tell you exactly what it means, but historically we've known that there's been some factors of mitochondrial gene expression that have been associated with migraine. So it sort of fits that in that component. If we look at the migraines that were non-menstrual, uh, we also see some of these also continued modifications, the glycophosphorylation, um, and uh, interesting, there's some adaptive immunity going on that may say why girls sort of get into this pathway of having more and more frequent headaches as well as the boys. And then for the menstrual genes themselves, um, we can also see are they the overlapping genes, but whether it's a menstrual migraine or not a menstrual migraine, we again see some mitochondrial genes um, as well as some RNA and DNA changing. So the next, and we've done this study now in kids. This is, I can't, because I don't have the final report yet, and I don't know the data from it, but I can talk to you about Vince Martin. He's a, an adult neurologist at Cincinnati Children, or Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati, that look at 21 girls, or women in this case, um, keep daily headache diaries as well as collect daily urine hormone samples. Um, one interesting thing in comparing the adults to the kids and the girls that we had do this, in the adults, he said it took about 70 to 80 percent that they got sampling of. So these adult women were missing about 20 to 30 days uh, per month where they did, or 20 to 30 percent of the days per month where they didn't collect the samples. Um, our girls, when we did it, they were at over 98 percent. So they were collecting urine samples every day for four months. Uh, we actually needed it for three months. We hadn't collected it for four months because we were thinking about the waste for the adult women, uh, but the girls didn't do that. So we, we do have some very clear cycles. But this is what Vince saw. Um, so if you looked at this, what we can see is uh, there's, there's several different peaks. Um, just to walk through this, so this is the day of the menstrual cycle. And there were different periods, and this was the risk of having a headache at the different times. So right during the menstrual period, and then it dwindles, dwindles down, and then right before the menstrual period, when the menstrual period appears here. So we looked at the odds of having a headache based on your hormonal level. And the suggestion was here that was when this estrogen withdrawal occurs, which has been historically seen in adults, is what's triggering it. The reason I show this is what it looks like we're seeing in the kids, in the girls in particular, it's not the estrogen withdrawal, it's the progesterone, because the girls don't show this this estrogen cycling pattern that show the progesterone pattern. So we may be able to learn from the kids what the adult study really means. Um, so this is just the study I talked about. And again, well, this should be coming through. Um, the uh, Tim Hool is actually doing that out analysis from us, just moved from Wake Forest to, to Harvard. And so he's in the midst of a move, so it got delayed a little bit. I was hoping to be able to show you those slides. And, emailed me apologetically on Monday and said he just doesn't have the graphs ready for it yet. So um, I apologize for that. So looking at the underlying pathophysiology risk, so that's sort of what happens during a migraine or during a menstrual migraine. So why are migraineurs like that? So is it genetic? Um, my belief is, yes, it is genetic. And part of that I'll show you now. We ask our kids, ask our families. 84% um, of the kids we see clearly know that there's a headache history in the family. They're a headache family. And 72% are enough to self-identify their migraines. Um, and so they're aware of it, at least in the family, that they may have migraines. Uh, there is some bias there, as, as 
we've been ongoing it for almost 20 years in Cincinnati. The Cincinnati area is convinced that everybody now has migraines instead of sinus headaches, which has helped out a lot. I'd actually uh, like to do that whole study starting back again and say what do people really think if the community is not as aware of migraines. Um, but where does the genetics come from? And this is a bit of an old study, but I think it's very important because it really does show that relationship between gene and environment interaction. So Svensson reported this on uh, 1,480 Swedish twins. Some of the advantage of these studies is they didn't have HIPAA and still don't have HIPAA, so they can actually compare all this stuff when kids are born and, and follow them. So these are, girl, or these are boys and girls that were born between uh, 1985 and 1986, so they were eight to nine years of age at the time. And at that time, we were using ICD-H1. Uh, the bottom chart just shows some of the details, but you could divide it into monozygotic, dizygotic twins. Uh, they're the same gender or dizygotic twins that were opposite genders. Uh, and this sort of gives the number and uh, the comparison. The bigger thing, I think, is the model and how you can look at the model. So this is the model that they, they developed out of that. So you've got twin one, which is the PT1, and twin two, which is PT2. And they can have a, either the shared environment if they were monozygotic, so that's the C, or they can have independent, just like any other sibling, um, and that's the additive genetic factor, and that's A, or they could have the environmental factor. And then you can separate those out. Um, so C actually, the shared environment, sorry, I said shared genetics, but C is the shared environment, so living in the same household, and then the genetics is determined whether they were monozygotic or dizygotic. So this is the data from their table. I should zoom in to actually, I think, the bottom line here. So if you look at each of those factors, so you've got the A factor, which is the genetic factor, you've got the C factor, which is the shared environment, and then you've got E factor, which is the independent environment. And if you look at the estimate, and you can roughly convert this to percentages, it means the genetic influence for these twins of having migraines is about 70% of the reason they have it, and that 30% of it's due to their environmental influences. So it is genetic degrees disease. We can't really change the genes, as we tell the kids, but we can sort of influence that 30% of their environmental factors. And this is where the biobehavioral aspects that we talk about, um, and you'll hear more about if you stay around today, to talk about include the uh, taking good care of yourself, eating, drinking, sleeping, and exercise, um, or potentially influencing some of the triggering or premonitory or protective factors that may be contributing it. So we have an advantage to be able to work on this part. So looking at some of the molecular biology, genes are beginning to be identified. I'm not going to go into full detail of these. The start with this was the familial hemiplegic migraine. So if we look at familial hemiplegic migraine, there's now at least four different gene sets that have been sort of identified. This walks through the original one, which is the CACNA1A um, gene that really has demonstrated that the hemiplegic migraines, our familial hemiplegic migraines, were a disruption of calcium channel. The um, reason I want to talk about this gene in particular is these are the various different polymorphisms that have demonstrated, and one in particular seems to be related much to migraines and has now been put into mice to look at, and that's the R192Q gene um, polymorphism. And if we look at this, um, they've looked at sleep-wake cycles in these in, in, uh, mice and how this relates to it. So to introduce sleep-wake cycles, um, there's really two different components. We can talk about advanced sleep, which is the equivalent of eastbound jet lag and delayed sleep or westbound jet lag, uh, which is really either which is staying up late and sleeping in late. And when you put these genes in mice, you can actually do that and force the mice into it. And the way you can force a mouse into doing it is mice are awake when it's dark, they're asleep when it's light, so you just flip the light switch. And so you can have light boxes where you can actually control this and look at the response. So you can take these knock-in mice that have this mutation, you can phase shift them, either phase this, shift them early, so the eastbound jet lag, or phase shift them late, delayed sleep, or westbound jet lag. And then look at the behavioral changes, but also look at their electrical physiological response pattern to it. And what they saw is the delayed sleep, so staying up late, sleeping in late, had really no effect between the wild type and the mutant mice. But what was interesting is that the um, advanced sleep seem to have increased or, or too rapid adjustment, um, which is really shown either in the bar graph here, where the wild type was here, um, and the, the mutant mouse is here, or in this panel right here, which shows that they really were statistically at every phase after the shift shifted. Um, what that see, see biologically? Well, there could be a variety of different reasons. There was a twofold increased enhancement pattern that seemed to happen as relationship with the suprachiasmic uh, neurons, but what are the real implications? Well, the implications are is that if you're taking a human and now instead of a mice and put them through jet lag or for the teenagers we take care of uh, is stay up late on the weekends, 
um, is what they're doing is they're shifting themselves basically advanced sleep and delayed sleep every week. So for those of us that take care of teenagers, we see that. They have to get up way too early in the morning. Um, and so most kids, at least in the Cincinnati area, and actually the CDC report, well, 15 years ago and the re-update last year showed that only North Dakota and Alaska have actually adopted the pattern, which is letting the kids sleep in a little bit later. Uh, most of the rest of the United States makes them get up way too early. And so on the weekends, they make up for it by uh, um, staying up late and, and sleeping in late. So what this means is that kids are going through this advanced sleep and delayed sleep, and it also explains why Monday and Tuesday now are the two worst days of the week for most kids with headaches. So do they all have the uh, 192 mutation? Probably not, but at least understanding the pathophysiology of the 192 mutation in the CACNA1A gene gives us some insight of why sleep pattern changes may be influential. Now, on the other side, the eastbound jet lag, so staying up late and sleeping in late on, Saturday, on Friday into Saturday, doesn't cause their headaches. So they can tolerate that part. They can't tolerate the going to bed early. If we look at the others, there's, there's several now other genes that have been identified in pulmonary hemiplegic migraine. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I bring up this slide is to really important that it's not just the gene and the, uh, it's not just the neuron and the synapse that's important, which is where the, the CACNA1A gene is, but the, that pulmonary hemiplegic migraine too actually occurs on the astrocytes. So it's the milieu that they're sitting into. Some of the other differences we're seeing are now the glial and microglial cells, which is why from our genomic studies, we can actually sample the blood to get reflecting what's going on in the astrocytes in the brain. But it really shows that everything that's going on is important, not just the neuron connection. So um, I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit so you don't have to try to read it. I think I'm probably the only one closest to the screen to actually read this from here, uh, but I also put it up for the reference. So if you're really interested in this, going into micro QTRs, um, study in headache currents, really at that time in 2012 accumulated the list of different polymorphisms. Uh, this list has grown, but I haven't found a published list that's in the, the current growth stage that's shown the latest. The latest I heard from last spring is we're up to 48 different genes uh, that may have polymorphism associated with migraines. Um, there is one, one clustering analysis that says it could be as high as 1,200 genes. I'm not sure I buy the 1,200 number, um, but somewhere probably between 48 and 1,200 is where we're going to fall out to. Uh, but he did, but uh, Michael collected this number. If we look at these genes and zoom in on a little bit, um, these are just listing the different genes. And part of the reason I point them out is just wanted to point out a few groupings that we see. So DRD are the dopamine receptor genes. So think about dopamine receptors and how it brings into treatment. So one of our emergency room or uh, infusion treatments that we oftentimes use are the dopamine antagonists. So that includes Composine, Reglan, um, so metoclopramide and plain propylperazine uh, for the acute treatment of migraines. Uh, the history behind this is in the 1970s when people came up with the nausea and vomiting. Those were the only antiemetics that were, that were currently available. So they were given to the migraineer because of the antiemetic property. Um, but their risk is, as, as any of us use those, knows that you can get dystonic, you get agitated, uh, you don't really like it. So then they tried to take away that part of it, which actually took away the dopamine antagonist part. So that's why the newer antiemetics don't actually work very well for migraines, but the old ones do. Um, by the, and on. A few slides, I'm going to actually show the pathway of our, the sequence of events that this mirrors. But I think it's important to recognize that now we're identifying the polymorphisms in the gene, the dopamine receptors may actually be a contributor to not only why they're having migraines, but also explain why they may be responsive to some of the treatments, as well as potential side effects. Another grouping to point out are also we talked about menstrual-related migraines, but several of the estrogen receptor genes are actually are. Um, involved with this. So it may not just be the progesterone story, but it may also be the combination of progesterone and estrogen. If we look at the next slide, we also see very similar sort of things. So um, there's, there's continued groupings on different chromosomes, and these are all arranged by different chromosomal groupings of different dopamine receptors that could be related to it. Um, there's also some gene metabolism components. Um, the bottom line to take away from this long list is not to try to memorize the whole list, but to see that this list is growing and that there's different areas in it, that not only is migraine a, a, a polygenetic disorder, but we probably are seeing a common phenotype of a multiple different genetic components of this disorder. And my hope, and I'm thinking that probably eventually will happen in the future, is we'll start to use that fifth digit of the ICDH3 criteria to say we really have a migraine of gene X, Y, or Z and it'll actually be able to identify it by their, their gene defect. Um, and, and, and this has been fairly rapid growth just over the last four or five years and continues to grow. Um, and then I just, for completion, included a GWAS table. Um, I think the gene polymorphisms may give us a little bit more insight. 
So what does this contribute to? So we now know that it's genetic. There may be um, somewhere between 40 to 50 to maybe 100 different genes that are contributing to this polygenetic polyphenotypic pattern. Um, but what happens if you look at the underlying brain? So took a few examples to, to just sort of give us flavor of this. Um, this has been done in multiple different sensory components, whether we talk about uh, visual sensation, allodyny, what I'll talk about in a second, but this is just interesting because I think it actually demonstrates sort of the oddball effect or auditory sensitivity. So as I mentioned in the criteria, kids with migraines, adults with migraines, are sound sensitive, um, so noises bother them. Well, if you take a group of people and you start giving them noise uh, and then look at their electrophysiological response, uh, what we see with the control is that you attenuate to it, so that's the green. So as you're hearing those background noises, which now we're all ignoring the different background noises, hopefully not my voice but the fans, um, what you can hear is you start to ignore it. Now that I pointed out, many of the audience are not hearing those fans um, because it was pointed out. But most of us can attenuate to that. What happens in the migraineur is they can't attenuate to this. So as they hear these noises, the noises continue to be more and more bothersome to it. And they've been able to demonstrate that by using the auditory ERP and migraines. Um, another area that actually the patients can oftentimes identify is allodynia. So I'm taking a little bit of divergence to talk about what allodynia is or the, the uh, larger component of cutinia, the larger name for it, cutinous allodynia with central sensitization, which makes the kids oftentimes laugh when I reel that out to them. Um, unfortunately, I ask them at the follow-up visit, so what do we talk about? And I think I've had three kids actually where say that it was that A word, and that's about as close as they've come. But I still talk about allodynia in all of them because I think it's an important understanding. So allodynia due, is due to the potential brainstem generator and thalamic stimulation. So uh, again, several studies, including work that Dr. Bernstein has done, has demonstrated that in the, in the mouse models, you see this increased activation. Um, he does it with something called an inflammatory soup on the brain. Um, they can be two different levels, activity dependent, which is in the initial stages. Uh, and when they looked at the correlation in adults, this is the first sort of two hours of a migraine attack. Um, and then there's activity independent. So meaning that if you get past that two hours, the allodynia sort of is, is independently functioning by itself. It no longer needs the migraines to have this increased sensitization. Um, there's a few observations that have been made for this in migraines. So Nine and Matthews looked at this in 2004 and really demonstrated that as people have had more and more migraines, uh, their increased their chances of having allodynia goes up, and that it was really having 10 to 15 uh, to 20 years of migraines. This was argued that kids then couldn't get allodynia because if it needs 10 to 15 years to really get to that point that over 50% of the population has migraines, kids just can't be old enough to get that. And I actually dispute that, and I'll show that in a second, because, well, this is what we demonstrate. So we ask kids about allodynia symptoms. Um, and these are things like, does it hurt to comb or brush your hair? Does it hurt to touch your head when you have a headache? Um, for girls, actually, the most sensitive one is, does it hurt to wear a ponytail? So for all those that take care of girls or all the females in the audience that have had ponytails, um, it's not the ponytail necessarily causing the headache, because you can be wearing the ponytail, you get the headache, and then you have to let the ponytail out, whereas other times you don't have it. Um, that's, there's, that's completely different, too. There's a, a subtype of headache, which I'm not going to talk about today, called the, the ponytail headache, but that's a different headache. Um, it's actually very interesting. It's, it's in, in different areas of the world where they've got very dense long hair. They seem to have a, actually a traction effect that's causing that. Uh, but these are normal girls that we see in the United States that don't really, may not have that really dense thick hair that's contributing to it. And boys uh, actually wearing caps seem to be the most sensitive one, um, which if the boys don't wear a hat, then oftentimes they get missed about being able to pick that up. Uh, just for completeness sake, if you are seeing adults and adults that actually, adult women, what they were able to find is the most sensitive ones are wearing earrings or necklaces uh, for women and shaving for men. So actually the, the act of shaving during a headache um, can be allodynic. But the takeaway from this slide is we can see as the kids get, and get older, we see more and more kids. So we get to that 50% mark by the time the kids are in their mid-teens and then it continues further. So the kids are developing this allodynia much more sensitive. Why is allodynia important to understand the treatment paradigms? Um, well, this again also, uh, I reference Rami quite a bit, but uh, I think I have respect for what a lot of the pathophysiology, and he's done a lot of the pathophysiology aspects. Um, this is just, and I'm going to focus more on the middle slide, um, the heating and cooling, because we've actually done these with kids now. Um, what this shows is you can tolerate, and if you put people, if you warm up there with a probe, uh, most people can tolerate up almost up to about 47, 48 degrees centigrade uh, or Celsius um, on warming before that warming starts to become uncomfortable. Um, if you cool them, you can also cool them down to about 16 or so degrees. Uh, if you start during a migraine attack and 
you treat them early, they, they become allodynic, so they start to notice that, they start to get into this pinker area. But if you treat them very early, they can pop out of the allodynia. If you wait to treat them, however, they remain allodynic, so there's sensitivity. So early treatment is explained by, partially by the allodynia. So what we did is we looked at some kids. So we've looked at 406 um, kids uh, between the ages of uh, 6 and 18. Uh, so we looked at pre-adolescence, early adolescence, and late adolescence, and we did the quantitative sensory testing. So we did the same sort of testing and measuring their temperature. Um, and this is what we saw. Um, what we found is those kids that we could identify by the questions, like a girl, does it hurt to wear a ponytail, versus those kids that don't, um, whether they had allodynia or not, and then measure their sensitivity, we actually were seeing that these kids were allodynic, not only by their independent report, but by their sensitivity. So the, the kids couldn't tolerate, or the allodynic kids, um, which are the shorter bars here, really couldn't detect on the forehead uh, sensitivity, or they became allodynic. The hash bars here shows what happens when they have a headache, and this is when they show they don't have a headache. So a couple takeaways from this is that in the shorter bars here, they're shown like I'm just going to focus on the forehead one, this one, this one, and this one, is those are kids that pre-identify themselves as being sensitive. So the girls that can't wear a ponytail, the boys that can't wear a hat. But not only were they sensitive to temperature changes when they were having a headache, which is this one, but also when they were headache-free. So even though they're not reporting that a ponytail bothers them or they hurts to wear a hat and when they're not having a headache, they're still just as sensitive. So the thalidinia may be ongoing and it becomes strengthened or, or increased further. I forgot I did those animations. So now we can subdivide those. I'm just looking at these are just the kids that self-report allodynia. And what we can see is a variety of different things. Uh, if we look at, and these are some of the different factors that people have asked about what happens in adults. So if we look, at, and again, the shorter the bar, the more allodynic they are, um, because this is all the cooling effect. The kids were more sensitive to the cooling than the warming. And we can see the girls, which is the purple right here, which are much more sensitive than the boys. And so it's not only having the ability to wear a ponytail, um, boys, some of our boys had ponytails too, um, but the, the fact that the girls seem to have more, more allodynic sensitivity that's developing, uh, which then can you sort of build on this theme that adult women Teenage girls are more likely than the boys to have migraines. The estrogen progesterone effect may be a contributor, but also the girls seem to be more allodynic. Um, if we also look across the ages, so this is the pre-pubertal, pubertal, and post-pubertal kids, we saw that as kids proceeded the ages. So we've gone away from the self-reporting to actually be able to test them, and we can test them now with these monetary sensory testing. So not only do kids get allodynia, but they develop it across their ages, and it may be a male-female difference that contributes to that. Um, this is just the summary that you can do a global assessment of allodynia um, by asking this, these simple questions. And the questions we usually ask is for the girls, does it hurt to wear a ponytail, does it hurt to comb or brush your hair for boys? We ask about combing or brushing your hair. I've got three boys, and I think my 13-year-old probably hasn't combed his hair since he was about four. Um, he just doesn't comb his hair, uh, except with his fingers. Uh, he doesn't. He looks, looks nice, but it's just, it's just not a comb. It's what that touches his head. So sometimes it's a little bit harder to tease out these questions, but I think it's important, especially if we take in together the adult treatment that says if you don't treat early, you're not going to be as effective. So what are the underlying physiological barriers and understandings? Well, migraines do, do have a genetic basis. They're a sensitive brain. Um, allodynia may be one insight into how that sensitive brain is developing and evolving, and, uh, and opens up future questions to sort of how do we address reversing that sensitive brain or addressing that sensitive brain at the very beginning of attack. So what happens during a migraine? To review some of these uh, components. Um, in 1995, these were volunteer medical students in Germany. So you're a medical student, you want to pass the class, you volunteered for doing the study. Um, and basically, you were having a migraine triggered. And this was sort of the first insight of where does the migraine come from or the migraine generator. And so the red boxes, uh, our voxels actually show where the migraine seems to trigger at. So migraine seems to be trimming around the periaqual ductal gray brainstem areas as a triggering point that then spreads up a little bit further into the thalamus. Uh, Michael Welch then sort of extended this um, in using high resolution at the time MRI scanning uh, was actually able to focus on and show that part of this activation or that the activation occurs in the periaqual ductal gray. And um, 
not walk through all the colors. The, the basic idea was that with this is they looked at iron deposition. And the reason to look at iron deposition, if migraine has an inflammatory process that's going on, the blood vessels have dilated. We talked about that a little bit, why kids feel lightheaded. And when the blood vessels dilate, they leak. When they leak, the red blood cells go out of the blood vessels. The body reabsorbs everything, but the iron's left behind. So you can look at, at the stages of chronic and brain inflammation to look at areas. And what they actually found was the periaqueductal gray seemed to be accumulating these iron depositions. We can look at it graphically, and, and the concerning point for this, and why I think it's, it's important to recognize migraines early in the stage rather than the later the stage, is if you look at the number of years that people had a headache and their frequency of headaches, what you'll be able to see is this line is in both cases, whether it's episodic migraine or chronic migraine, is upward going. So the longer you've had migraines, especially uncontrolled migraines, the more iron deposition that you have and the more potential you have for refractory or more difficult to treat headaches. So this is sort of insight that, that really understanding the imaging pathophysiology recognizes the reason it's important for all of us to take care of kids to say it's important for us to recognize the migraines early and try to take care of them so they don't become the refractory adults that, that have to suffer from migraines. Um, moving on to some of the studies that we also look at the sensitive brain aspect and what's going on. So we have a magnetic encephalogram machine, or a MEG, that looks at the magnetic activity that's going on during the brain. We use this for our epilepsy patients. We use it for some of our um, autism patients or our cerebral palsy patients. But now we've also looked at, at migraine patients, and actually for the last 10 years or so, have started studying migraine patients and what happens in terms of the magnetic activity underlying the brain. Um, so there's three stages of that happens. The one I'm going to talk about initially is beginning in the acute stages. So what we were able to do is, is using our infusion and our inpatient unit is when kids came into the hospital with an acute severe migraine, between sort of treatment doses, we said, well, you mind if we stick you in a MEG scanner and look at what's happening to your magnetic activity and really assessing your brain functioning during an acute migraine attack. Um, the one we're gonna, the, I'm going to show you some data from is we used a finger tapping technique. And what this technique is, is that kids are wearing headphones in the MEG scanner. They hear a click, either in their right side or the left side. And when they hear the click, they're supposed to tap the finger on that side that they hear the click. And so we can measure the time period as well as the wave pattern from the time they hear the click to the time the action occurs or the, the tapping of the fingers. And then we can compare the two. So what happens? They hear the click. They may have it in the right or left ear. And then we see a wave pattern that develops. And the wave pattern has basically three different waves. This, we look at the first wave, second wave, third wave, after the blue line that shows the click. If we look at it, and this is just one patient, one migraine and one control, so they do 200 different clicks. You can see if we line up the click, the triggering point, what you can see is that the migraineurs actually have a delay. Um, numerically, this is a 40% delay. So the brain is functioning 40% slower during the migraine attack than when they're not having a migraine attack. It's obvious to the kids because they say, yeah, when I've got a migraine, I just can't think. It's hard to think. Well, we can demonstrate now why it's hard to think because your brain's not working. Um, if we look at what happens, and this is some of the good news of it, is that ictually the kids are slower. So this is the latency. It takes up to 40 milliseconds to get the first, first uh, wave to occur. Um, but between attacks and compared to controls, they normalize. So at least the kids during the acute headache attack um, seem to be able to recover from it. Um, the study we're currently doing with the MEG, and uh, we're down to five more patients we've got to enroll, um, is we're looking at what happens to these kids that are having a headache every day. Because if you're having a headache every day, is it really slowing your thinking, and is that more important to get that reversed? <laughs> we can look at the second latency or the third wave and the, th uh, the second and third wave and seen universally. So the whole pattern has shifted. So it's not just that initial delay, but each stage of the delay, there's a progressive shifting, and that's why during the this is just right ear and left ear, so you can merge these two together. But each one has a cumulative effect. So every stage of hearing the click to getting to the tap is delayed, um, um, typically about 30 to 40 percent. The other advantage of MEG is you can actually localize where these, some of these delays are occurring. Um, so if we look at the colors, if you look at a normal person when you're hearing the click, these are the different ages, uh, the wave one, two, and three that sort of get triggered across here. But if we look at the migraineur, we can see there's a much larger. So the migraineur is actually having to incorporate a lot more brain structure to be able to accomplish the task. And uh, if we combine all these into one, this is an example. So if we look at a normal control, they really only need to be used about this part, much part of their brain to do the clicking task. But if you look at a migraineur, it actually has to overlap to the other side. So they're actually having to incorporate almost twice as much of their brain to just simply tap their fingers when they hear an auditory response. 
So there are pathophysiological changes that seem to be occurring both in a chronic and acute migraines. The chronic part with iron deposition, the acute migraine, they've been able to demonstrate with the neurophysiological changes. So how can we imply treatment and develop treatment into this? So for acute treatment, um, this is what the patients want. So patients obviously want their headache gone and they don't want it to come back. Um, not all our medicines can help doing that, but we've really got two groups of medicines we can look at. Uh, this is the list from a review. Uh, I used this old slide basically to show up. It hasn't changed all that much. We've got the 5-HT1 agonists and the NSAIDs that are probably the two of the ones to do. We look at inflammatory changes. Um, again, this goes back almost 15 years. If we looked at three different inflammatory markers, uh, during a migraine attack, all these inflammatory markers go up. The bottom line is migraine does have a secondary inflammation. So how do you incorporate that? Well, you compare ibuprofen versus acetaminophen in kids, so you've got a non steroidal anti-inflammatory versus one that doesn't have an anti-inflammatory response. So when Dr. Heimelainen did this, using eight-year-old kids, there's adult studies and older kids, but as a pediatric talk, uh, I'd like to go back to the youngest kids that we start with. So we look at an eight-year-old kid. This was ICDH1, so the original criteria. Kids had to have at least two migraines per month or two headaches per month in a migraine patient and exclude any sort of other disease that may be contributing. Um, gave some fairly healthy doses in this double-blinded randomized placebo control study, so it wasn't underdose. So the, the, the acetaminophen dose was 15 milligrams per kilogram. The agriculture dose was 10 milligrams per kilogram. And what happened, the bottom line is that as migraines and inflammatory disorders, which you can see from the inflammatory markers, is that ibuprofen works. So ibuprofen is three times more effective in one hour. So within one hour, you had a three times odds of your headache gone, being gone if you took ibuprofen versus placebo. Tylenol by one hour had no effect. Uh, by two hours, the acetaminophen, the Tylenol had a two hour, two, was twice as good as placebo. So it did start to separate a little bit. So there's things beyond anti-inflammatory that's contributing. But by that time, ibuprofen uh, was four times more effective or nearly four times more effective um, as well as being twice as effective as, as the acetaminophen. The other group of acute agents we have to talk about are the serotonin agents. Um, Serotonin in its recognition of migraine starts out, goes back to the 1960s. And this is when it was recognized that during a migraine attack, there were shifts in the serotonin levels in the blood. So if you injected somebody with serotonin, um, their headache actually went away for about 15 minutes. And this led to the whole field of the development of the uh, tryptans or the 5-HT1BD agonist. Um, if we look at the tryptans, uh, we can look at where the 5-HT1D receptors are. Um, we talked about Michael Welch's work that showed that there's some periaqueductal gray activation, which we see here, as well as some, some more of the peripheral 5-HT1 receptors. So we can see the binding sites for the, the tryptans seem to be associated with where the periaqueductal gray. Um, but we can also look at the genetics. So if we go back to some of those slides that I showed with all the different genetic risks, uh, one of them included the serotonin transporter. So we now know the serotonin transporter in the intronic region can have either short or long alleles. Um, and then you can correlate a genotype phenotype components. And if you found that if you have this short allele, um, so if you're the FS type, you also had an increased frequency of headaches. So you, both groups could have migraines, but if you happen to have the FS type, you add more migraines. So it can change one aspect of the phenotype. So what are the tryptans currently available? If we talk about the tryptans in a treatment talk, the, we currently now have um, uh, seven different tryptans plus a combination. Uh, for, for the first time in the last couple of years, we've been able to say that now some of these tryptans are actually approved for kids. In fact, one of them, the rise of tryptans, now approved down to age six. So there no longer is the case that we don't have approved medications for the treatment of kids, but the pathophysiology is that we've got two groups of medicines, the NSAIDs like ibuprofen and the tryptans, which several of them listed here, um, that we can actually use uh, uh, realistically. They're probably all safe and effective in kids. If we look at an adult, though, the tryptans aren't perfect. Um, they fall somewhere around the 50 to 80 percent effective rate. If we look at the placebo effect, though, um, the placebo effect even in adults was nearly 40 percent. So you get a bit of a boost from having the tryptans, but it's not a perfect answer because everything to the right here were people that didn't respond to tryptans. And those similar numbers uh, exist for kids, with the exception that the placebo rate moves even closer. So it's really hard to separate those out. I mentioned dopamine a little bit, and we talked about the dopamine receptor. Um, the suggestion of dopamine and migraine, again, goes back to the 1970s. That's when people started using the procopirazine and the metoclopramide for the acute treatment of migraines. Um, and then Dr. Lance, who is actually one of our founders for headache medicine, really discussed the brainstem role of the dopamine receptors. If we look, what happens is you start giving people more and more dopamine, 
Um, and this list of the side effects, I think on the next slide I show it actually graphically. Um, it starts out, you get sort of yawning and mood changes. So if you talk to a migraine, what do they first notice? Well, they start yawning more, they start getting more irritable, they don't have a headache yet. Then they may start to get a little nauseous or anorexic, they don't feel like eating. Eventually they may get to vomiting and then if you get them too much, they get dyskinesias. So this is just giving somebody more dopamine and what happens is you give them more dopamine. Um, so a dopamine antagonist like the procopirazine amoxicillin can actually start to reverse some of this. So understanding the clinical phenotypic characteristics of what happens when you give in dopamine and stopping them may explain why those medications seem to work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about medication overuse. Uh, part of the reason it gets back to some of our genomics. Um, so I've talked about the using acute treatments, whether it's the NSAIDs, the tryptans, or the dopamine antagonists, but what happens if you overuse them? So this is as one component of a study that we looked at in chronic kids with uh, more than 15 headache days per month. Um, we were comparing responders versus non-responders uh, to our initial treatment, uh, both before they got treatment and after got treatment. But we have a little bit of an extra here that we couldn't quite figure out, so we figured out these were kids that were overusing their pain medicine. So just to focus on what happens in the gene expression profile of taking acute medications too often. So what we can divide kids in, and we, we took their blood sample from them, ran their genes before we began any treatment, and then we asked them just to stop overusing their pain medications uh, and see what happens both to their genes as well as to the response. So six weeks later, if they dropped down from almost 30 headache days per month to less than 10, we called them responders. If they didn't, they were called non-responders. And again, another heat map, but really just shows that the kids that responded had a completely different genetic profile versus those that didn't. Part of the reason I like to show this out is we're doing whole blood sampling, but this is where all the, the tissues that we could relate these gene expressions were. So these were all brain tissues that we were actually detecting. Whole brain was 154 of the genes, but if we talk about some of the different locations or pathways we've talked about already today, includes the trigeminal ganglia, the superior cervical ganglia, pathways that have historically been shown um, to be involved with pain transmission in the brain. So medication overuse, taking pain medicines too often, actually alters your brain's genetic expression profile toward brain sensitivity, which explains why it stops working. You keep taking the ibuprofen every day, you keep taping your medicines every day, but it seems to work less and less, and that's because your genes are being modified. The final parts I want to talk about were prophylactic treatment or prevention, um, more in a, a global sense to think about some of these. Not going through all the studies, but we've got AED. The AEDs have been shown a variety of different times to be useful for migraines, so the antiepileptics that are GABAergic agents, like the valproate, the gabapentin, um, may be effective. Uh, but gabapentin hasn't really been looked at in migraines, but has that potential. And then there's other compounds that have also been looked at. Pyramate and levotiracetam and denisamide are probably the top three that have also been used for migraine aspects. The two groups we tend to focus on is one is amitriptyline. Um, like, uh, we talked a little bit about the CHAMP study or the, our comparative study. This is why we chose it. Amitriptyline is actually the number one used prevention medication for headaches in the world. Um, it's been around, used uh, since Dr. Couch first sort of did some of the studies in the early 70s. Um, it works probably because it's a nonspecific reuptake inhibitor uh, that can block multiple different systems that are involved. So we incorporate that with the current U.S. number one treatment, which is topiramate. We've developed our, our, our CHAMP study uh, for children and adolescent migraine prevention study. It's a comparative effectiveness study compared to amitriptyline versus topiramate versus placebo. We have 34 sites involved. Um, I can tell you some baseline data because we finished that data. It's actually been accepted for publication. should be coming out very soon. Um, the primary outcome, I can't tell you. It hasn't been accepted today. I haven't actually written the article yet. So I have to wait and invite me back to hear those or, or come to one of our headache meetings. Uh, hopefully we're, our plan is within the next one or, one month or two. Next month or two, we should have it submitted. But some interesting findings we found from the baseline data, and I talked about this a little bit last night with the, some of the residents and, and faculty. Um, so the way we did the study is that they had to have ICDH2 criteria, uh, they, it's equivalent to ICH3, had to be between the ages of 8 and 17, had to have between 4 and 28 days per month. So the typical kid that's going to come into a clinic to be treated for migraines. They were then randomized to amitriptyline to placebo. Um, at, but prior to the randomization, though, they had to have a 28-day baseline so we could actually collect their frequency. Some of the interesting observations we've had from the baseline is historically we said kids have a high placebo effect. In fact, Dr. Prinsky, one of my mentors, said that 50% of kids get better just by sending them to a child neurologist, and um, no matter what's done. The interesting thing we found out of our baseline is even though we employed a diagnostic criteria, they all got a standardized diagnostic criteria, they all got an acute treatment plan, they all got a biobehavioral plan, how to take good care of themselves, 
But over that 28-day baseline, their headache frequency didn't change. It wasn't until they got randomized that we started to see a change, meaning that there has to be some degree, whether it's the active agent or the expectation of improvement that's important. And again, those results will have to come. Um, finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about nutraceuticals and their role. Um, I mentioned mitochondrial function, which includes riboflavin, coenzyme Q10, as well as some carnitine. Um, riboflavin, there's been several studies. It's involved in stages of electron transport chain. Uh, and it, if we look at it graphically, riboflavin, this is the electron transport chain that is uh, as one and two um, components of it. You can see riboflavin is involved in various stages to it. Um, if we look at riboflavin, an adult study actually showed that it was an effective prevention agent in a double randomized placebo control study. Um, and, and what they found that it was basically equivalent to, to divalproate in terms of its effectiveness and responsiveness. What we do is we actually sample the kids. We do a riboflavin level. Um, the blue bar across the top is actually the normal range of riboflavin. This is the distribution of our patients. So even though some of the kids are in the normal range, you can see they're skewed in deficiency. What's the primary dietary source of riboflavin? Um, besides stuff that is added to, it's green vegetables. So we talked about it's important for kids to eat their green vegetables. We look at coenzyme Q10, also involved in two different stages, including as its inflammatory response stage, as well as the uh, electron transport chain. Um, Todd Rosen did this study that actually demonstrated that it is effective to use coenzyme Q10 in the prevention. But similarly, and, and it's a, we looked at the deficiency, so the normal range for rival for coenzyme Q10 is 0.5 to 1.5. Um, Pre-treatment, the average of all the kids we see uh, that we start prevention on is right around 0.5. They really are overlapping at the very bottom of coenzyme Q10. Um, it's not on this slide, but we can actually know if you're below 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.35, you probably have some polymorphisms in your belly to produce coenzyme Q10. Uh, our body actually produces it. If you're above, above 0.4, but you're still deficient, you're probably consuming TOQ10 faster than you can replace it. Um, and so to test this, we actually did a, a randomized placebo control study. Um, what we looked at, and we actually was a crossover study. So if you look at the pink lines compared to the yellow lines, the kids responded very quickly to CoQ10 compared to placebo. But when we crossed them over, the kids that were getting Q10 that got placebo got slightly worse, whereas those kids that got placebo that got Q10 got better. So uh, in a crossover design, we did show that there was benefit to the CoQ10. Um, so let's let those two. I just provide an episodic clinic. And then the final two nutraceuticals to talk about, if you haven't heard about vitamin D enough, we talk a little bit about vitamin D. It's been involved now in brain dysfunctions, including multiple sclerosis, possibly early dementia and chronic diseases. So we've started looking at it in, in migraine kids. Um, the normal range is, is, and there's a reason there's not a normal bar, is sort of in dispute. But if you look at it from a physiological process, you probably should have above 40 um, at a level. If you look at our kids, 70% of our kids are below 40. So kids are very deficient in, the, in vitamin D. So if we identify their low, in fact, some of these kids are actually extremely low. There is some seasonal variation in Cincinnati. We, we do get lots of clouds in the, in, the, uh, in the winter. So we do see that if we look at the levels in the, the winter months, which is, is, is uh, with those averages and total numbers, uh, we look at the, the dips here. And then in the summer, it seems to come up, and then it dips back down. But again, if we use 40 as a cutoff, and this is the total number of patients in each sample, we can see that deficiency. Um, the newest one we're looking at is folate. Uh, if you follow the field a little bit, there was a study recently shown that migraine with aura may be associated with folate. And if you look at the genes, the MTHFR gene seems to be associated with that. Um, we don't have any data for that, but uh, the, which is actually I cut out that slide. So I was going to show a graph. It was just a blank slide. But we're starting to look at folate levels. Um, the last thing I really want to talk about is the importance of biobehavioral treatment and incorporation of treatment. We talked a little bit about you may have a sensitive brain. You can stress that sensitivity by altered sleep patterns. So that's why we talk about kids. It's important to drink plenty of fluid, get regular sleep, um, eat healthy foods, including the green vegetables that may have riboflavin in it, um, the dairy products that might have vitamin D. Um, but you may also need coping studies. So uh, our final study that I'm going to mention is our coping skill study for chronic migraine. Um, this is why I think it's imperative to have psychologists and behavioral therapists involved. We're actually able to demonstrate in, in looking at kids that are, again, our typical kids in a 20-week treatment phase or with a 12-month follow-up that they actually got better. And this is graphically what shows that. And what we can see is that in using these kids with chronic headaches, comparing controls, which is the dash bar, to the active agents, 
um, that within the, in, in 20 weeks, kids that had gotten, these were all chronic kids that got cognitive behavioral therapy, um, actually were doing significantly better. But even interestingly, at a follow-up 12 months later, they were still better. So even these kids in the dash bars were able to get cognitive behavioral therapy, but that early cognitive behavioral therapy is actually very important. I'm not going to talk much about outcomes. There's several different studies that I've listed here. We've looked at outcomes. Um, kids that don't come back are actually not coming back because they're doing better. So we don't need to get upset about kids that don't come back and follow up because they're doing well. And that's what, what Dr. Kabusha's study showed. Uh, we're trying to see what happens in these young adults as they transition, how important it is to do self-management and perception of their diagnosis to improve their outcomes. And then finally, really a question we don't have yet to answer is what happens to these refractory kids, the kids that aren't doing well as they go on, and how, what happens as they transition into adulthood. So again, some future talks to come. So we can take these different components of migraines and hopefully through this sort of whirlwind tour of the pathophysiology and the treatments, we can put all these pieces back together and really have a better understanding of migraines. So I thank you for all your time. Um, hopefully you've learned a little bit about the pathophysiology. You can start to incorporate into your plan. But thank you very much, and I'd also want to just thank you all the people that have actually helped me out with this.